you and thank you all for coming out, not only for Bill McKibben and his new book, but I'm fairly certain that if you're in this room, uh, you feel as passionately as I do that it's time for us to do much bolder steps with respect to the legislature, with respect to our individual decisions uh, to take on climate change. Uh, am I accurate in that? If, if you are like me, then you are looking at the political situation in Vermont right now and going, in November of 2018, we just elected the largest majority we've ever had of supposedly strong leaders in the legislature in order to take on this exact issue and many others. And I'm actually a little, if not a little, a little bit more than a little, disappointed at the scale of what is happening in the State House relative to the scale of the problems and the catastrophe that we are facing, given the report we just heard yesterday, are we not? So, um, because I'm an interloper to the event, I wasn't on the schedule and I've got about a minute, uh, and that's it. I just want to say that, you know, we're probably not going to turn the situation around in the next week or two at the State House. Uh, at this point, most of the, the events are happening the way they're going to happen over there. But I want to urge many people here who probably are represented by good legislators, you probably generally, you know, down here in Montpelier, in Callis, in Washington County, you generally got good legislators, is to call your legislators. Don't just assume good legislators are going to push the envelope a little farther than you would expect them to. There's a lot of pressure sometimes from leadership to say, well, we don't want to go too far because we might lose a few of our legislators in some swing districts or whatnot, and we have to be careful. And I just want to tell you that I was in the legislature in 2000, and we had about 15 legislators who said, I'm going to stand up for our gay and lesbian friends, brothers, sisters, relatives, neighbors, and going to say, we need to stand up for equal rights for all our lives. So we passed civil unions, and about 15 legislators lost their seats. Anybody remember that? Anybody here in Vermont that happened? We want to thank those folks, but here's what the, the story is all about. What are we elected there to do, and what are we willing to lose for? You ask a single one of those legislators, in hindsight, do you wish you hadn't voted for that so you could have been there to do a few more good things or you go to bed and rest easy with your head on the pillow every night? I'm pretty sure you all know the answer to that question. They changed the story of Vermont and we changed the story of this country and in fact, after that, Ireland and around the world, people and countries all over the world made a change. We can do that with climate change. And we're in a political environment where after the 2018 election, the turnout in 2020 is only going to be better here in Vermont. And so the risk isn't even there. So please call your good legislators and ask them, what are they doing to be bold on climate change in January of next year? And how are they going to bring home much more bold legislation? Because while I appreciate $4 million for weatherization, what if we had $30 million? I appreciate a million dollars or whatever it is for expanding broadband. What if it was $30 million so that people didn't have to commute to work every day at their cost? So I'm going to wrap up because here's the signal. I, Bill was a hero of mine and I'm sure of yours. And uh, so I hope you have a wonderful evening. I'm going to run home and put another layer of road cover on the zucchini that we just transplanted today at the farm to make sure it doesn't frost on them tonight. But thank you for being out here and continuing to fight for the cause. Thank you.
which I forgot to tell him we're starting. <laughs> His newest book, Falter, has the human game begun to play itself out. It's already a bestseller, landing at number 14 on the New York Times bestseller list. This should give us all hope, just as the size of this audience gives me hope, that we can turn the sinking ship around. As the New York Times book review states, Falter wastes no time. It's a direct, attention-grabbing sprint through what we've done to the planet and ourselves, why we haven't stopped it, and what we can do about it. And, as McKibben states in the opening notes to the book, we have the tools to stand up to entrenched power. I thought there'd be clapping. <laughs> Again, I'm glad we're all here. If you haven't yet read Falter, we do have copies for sale, and Bill will be able to sign your book after the talk. Our program tonight will consist of a presentation by Bill McKibben on his newest book, followed by a facilitated discussion with Vermont Law School's Dean of Environmental Programs and Director of the Environmental Law Center, Jennifer Rushlow, we will also hear from Vermont Law School professor Rachel Stevens, who is the chair of the executive committee of the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club. She will talk briefly about the work of the Sierra Club and what you can do to be involved and make a difference for Vermont and our planet. I want to thank the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club for being a sponsor of this event Bear Pond Books is happy to donate proceeds from tonight's book sales to them, and we hope you are engaged to donate to them directly at the table in the back. I'd also like to thank our speakers for coming, Orca Media for filming this event for public access television, and I thank all of you for coming to this important call to action. If you are interested in continuing this discussion, Please join us for a conversation for change with Sun Common Vermont at Bear Pond Books next Tuesday at 7 p.m. All who attend will be offered a free copy of the book, Draw Down, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming. To learn more and to RSVP for that event, please visit our website, bearpondbooks.com or pick up a flyer, we have them at the front table where the books are available. To start us off with opening remarks, please help me welcome from the Vermont chapter of the Sierra Club, Rachel Stevens.
In fact, my wife had been telling me all the time, oh, it's terrible, it's cold and raining here day after. I got back yesterday and I was like, I don't have a problem, it's so looks good to me. So, um, it's really good to be here. Thank you to the Sierra Club for uh, 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 all the work that you do. At 350, we work hard with the club all over the world and it's always great. Thank you to Bear Pond. Um, you guys don't need me to tell you this, but communities that took their local bookstore for granted no longer have a local bookstore. So Bear Pond is one of the great institutions in Vermont and it's always fun to get to come and do things. Yeah, I'll try to put the mic a little. How's that? A little better. Thank you. All right. I'm actually not going to read to you from my book, I don't think. Because it's really, it's not poetry. It's not, it does not benefit. You're all able to read. Um, um, it doesn't really benefit from me reading it. Uh, maybe, maybe a tiny bit if we run out of other things to do. But basically, what I want to talk about, I mean, I don't see so many people here who've worked so hard on this fight over the years. And so what I really want to talk about just for a minute is kind of where we are, or maybe in a way, to just sort of talk about the lessons that I've learned over the last 30 years. Because it was 30 years ago this year that The End of Nature came out, which was the first book about climate change. And my first book, and someone the other day showed me my author photo from that book. I was 27 when I wrote it, which I guess so 28 when it was published, so I you know, had a full head, black hair, and I, I was worry-free, and you know. But, um, and of course, it's normal and correct that I've changed a good deal in the intervening three decades. Something would be wrong if I Look the same. What's not normal is that the planet has changed enormously in that same three decades, and things as large as our planet are supposed to be stable over that period of time, and instead we've seen this dramatic and violent flux. So the first lesson for me in an important way is things can and do change very fast. I mean, I'm particularly cognizant of this, just thinking about it today, because that report that the UN issued yesterday on biodiversity telling us we're going to lose a million species over the next few decades. I mean, even for me, who spends every day of my life dealing with this stuff, just a punch in the gut. Um, um, it's a kind of pre-obituary for an enormous amount of the flora and the fauna that we were born onto this planet with. And, and it's, every word is to be taken utterly seriously when you reflect on what's happened over the last three decades. Seventy percent of the summer sea ice in the Arctic is gone now, okay? Uh, the oceans are 30 percent more acidic than they were. Um, we've begun to see absolute discombobulation of the planet's hydrological cycles, the way that water moves around the planet. We've begun to see the most extreme kind of events. Sometimes we really see them up close because they have come to places where there's plenty of cameras. So everybody got to watch last autumn as a city in California, literally called paradise, literally turned into hell inside half an hour. And once, for any rural American, once you've seen people burning to death in their cars trying to flee down a two-lane road in a forest fire, you can't unsee those pictures because it's too easy to put yourself in precise. But many of the time, there is no camera where things are going on. Um, the iron law of climate change, remember, is the less you did to cause it, the sooner and harder you get hit. So have some room in your heart right now for, say, the people in Mozambique. They've been hit in the last five weeks with the two largest cyclones ever to hit Southeast Africa. The second one, Kenneth, dropped six and a half feet of rain on parts of Mozambique, which, I mean, you remember what happened when we got 13 inches from Irene. Um, um, try to imagine six and a half feet of rain. Uh, in a place that's already incredibly poor, already underserved in terms of public health, in a place where people are losing their year's crop now on and on and on. One of the theses of the first part 
part of this book is that a way to think about this is the planet on which we live is now shrinking and fairly dramatic. There were, last summer, a number of cities in the Mideast and along the Persian Gulf that reached the highest temperatures we've ever reliably recorded on Earth, 129 degrees Fahrenheit. Some of them along the Persian Gulf, the humidity was so high that what the meteorologists call the, the feels like temperature, the heat index was about 165 degrees. 129 degrees, and by the way, I can set my oven to 130 degrees, okay? 129 degrees, human beings can survive it for a few hours, but not much more than that in an uncooled room because your body simply can't cool off fast enough to deal with it. Well, on current trajectories, the scientists are quite clear that by the middle to the latter part of the century, a vast swath of the Earth much of the Asian subcontinent, much of the North China Plain, much of the Middle East, we'll see those kind of temperatures dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of days a year. In effect, there'll be no-go zones, just in the same way that our coastal cities are now under real assault. Uh, we've been expanding our footprint ever since we left Africa, you know, as a species, but now, it's, now we're on a smaller planet that's closer to the sun, and that's just a way to kind of try and imagine the scale of what we're doing. The second thing that it took me, that I kind of realized over those 30 years, and it informs everything I do now, and it was the thing that took me way too long to realize that I keep myself for, was not figuring out, I thought that we were in an argument about climate change for a long time. I mean, what I told you I was 27 when I wrote The End of Nature, my theory of change at the time was people will read my book and then they will change. Um, <laughs> even when that proved to be optimistic, um, um, I, I continue to think, because I'm a writer, that what we needed was more books, more speeches, more symposiums, more articles. Eventually, the weight of evidence would cause our leaders to do the right thing, because why wouldn't they? It took me a long time to figure out that we were had long since won the argument. By the mid-1990s, the world scientists were in robust agreement about what was going on. We won the argument, but we were losing the fight because the fight was not about data and reason. The fight was what fights are always about, money and power. And the other side of this fight had more money and more power than, well, I mean, the fossil fuel industry is the richest industry there ever was. And they were able to use, and are able to use, that money to make sure that nothing changed. They have done what it takes to preserve their business model, even at the cost of breaking the planet. That sounds hyperbolic. I might not have said it a few years ago quite that way, but we now have great investigative reporting that proves the fossil fuel industry knew everything there was to know about climate change back in the 1980s. Their scientists told them how much it was going to warm and how fast, and their scientists would believe. Exxon started building every drilling rig they built to compensate for the rise in sea level they knew was coming. What they didn't do was tell any of the rest of us. Instead, they spent billions of dollars on this building this architecture of deceit and denial. They hired all the guys from the tobacco wars. They even hired some of the people who smeared Rachel Carson in the 1960s. And they set to work, um, um, well, they set to work on the most consequential lie in human history. The lie that we didn't know what was real about climate change. We weren't sure that this was happening and so on and so forth. They set up an absolutely sterile, phony debate about whether or not global warming was real, a debate that both sides knew the answer to at the beginning. Okay? Um, it's just one of them was willing to lie about it. And as a result, you know, we've been paralyzed for 30 years. We've lost 30 years. If the CEO of Exxon, in 1988, after Jim Hansen testified before Congress about climate change, if he'd simply gone on TV that night and said, you know what, our scientists are telling us just the same thing, which, by the way, seems to be the least that any moral or ethical system would demand, no one would then have said, oh, 
Exxon just a bunch of alarmists paying them no attention, you know, we would have gotten to work. Instead, we've gone from George H.W. Bush in 1988 promising or running for president to, quote, fight the greenhouse effect with the White House effect. We've gone from that to the current Republican president announcing that climate change was a hoax manufactured by the Chinese. A position, so, if you were sitting on the bus next to someone who began muttering that, you would get up and change seats. <laughs> but there we are. It is, it is that confluence of ideology and interest, self-interest, that's gotten us where we are, and it's getting worse by the minute. I don't know if other people saw this or not. I just was finishing a piece. I was sitting back there for the New Yorker for tomorrow for the website. Yesterday, a couple of hours after that UN report came out, our Secretary of State went to a meeting of the Arctic Council up in Finland. And at which point everybody else was talking about the sort of horror of the fact that the Arctic was melting. And he started in on what a great idea it was and how it should melt faster because as soon as it was done melting, we'd be able to cut a couple of weeks off the time it took a ship to get to China and back with all the junk. In. And he was going on and on about, oh, there's gold and diamonds up there that we can go. I mean, it was like, you know, having Gollum for Secretary of State. It was just insane. But that's where we are. I mean, that's what we're up against. Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, took more money from the Koch brothers than any other politician in our Congress, okay? He's the place where the Koch brothers and the oil industry and Ayn Rand kind of meet in this uh, 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 kind of diabolical place. So in that world, the third lesson for me was that a movement is therefore a very good thing to have. Um, the only way to balance that kind of power and wealth is if you can get enough people engaged in fighting. And of course, that's why we started 350 when we did. I was thinking of that the other day because Vermont 350 organized this beautiful walk across the state from uh, starting in Middlebury uh, uh, to Montpelier. It kind of was an echo of the one that certain people in this room were on in 2006 when we walked up the west side of the state to Burlington. When we got there, after, I don't remember, I remember very well arriving at the Burlington city line, there were about a thousand of us marching, and, and Bernie, then Congressman Sanders, came to the city limits to meet us. And, you know, he's a activist by when it's just his thing. He was so thrilled to see all this. He kept saying, this is so great. I haven't seen anything like this since the Vietnam War. This is fantastic. This is so great. What is this about again? <laughs> Bernie's gone on to be the absolute great champion of all these things in our Congress. And really the reason that we've broken some of the political logjam, the reason now that every Democratic candidate is putting forward remarkable plans about climate change and so on. But when we did that march, the Free Press the next day had a story that said that thousand people was probably the largest demonstration that had yet taken place about climate change in the United States. And I read that, and I thought, no wonder we lose. You know, we've got everything you need for a movement. We've got Al Gore, we've got scientists, we've got policy. The only part of the movement we forgot was the movement part. And we need that. And so that's what people have built over the years, many people in this room, um, and I, I will just tell you that, that right at the moment, it feels to me like we're in a real moment as a result of all that movement building. Some of it's things that have been going on for a while. Uh, the fights against pipelines that started with the Keystone Pipeline in 2011 have now spread to every possible thing that anybody tries to build. Um, Sometimes we get started too late, as with the gas pipeline on the west side of the state, which was a tremendous sadness to see that anachronism built when it didn't need to be. But it won't, nothing like that will ever get built in Vermont again, I'm almost sure, because we will make sure that it doesn't happen. Um, um, but, but now every frack well, every coal mine, every pipeline in the world gets fought, 
And it's amazing, we win a fair number of these, and even when we don't, um, we cause them all kinds of trouble. The head of the American Natural Gas Institute gave a speech to his industry peers a, a month or two ago, about a year ago, and he said, somehow we have to stop the keystoneization of everything that we're trying. <laughs> made my dark heart happy, I must say. Um, um, you know, the divestment work that people have engaged in is amazing. We're, I was talking to Naomi Klein on the phone on the way up here today as she and I sort of dreamed up this idea in 2012. And neither of us thought when we started it that we would now have $8 trillion worth of endowments and portfolios that have divested in part or all from fossil fuel. It's been astonishing to see, uh, uh, you know, um, um, and it's working. And Shell Oil declared in its annual report this year that divestment had become a material risk to its business. Uh, the coal CEOs at their big meeting in Houston last week, there was a story in Politico with one after another who just complaining that they could no longer find capital to expand because too many funds had divested from fossil fuel. It made me really happy that this week. So pleased now that New York City has divested its $200 billion pension fund, that the Norwegians have divested their sovereign wealth fund, all made on North Sea oil. It's the biggest pool of investment capital on Earth. That the whole country of Ireland divested every single public dollar out of fossil fuels last summer. I gotta say, it makes me a little sad that for reasons that no one has ever been able to explain to me, Vermont has refused adamantly to divest its pension fund. It's not going to make or break the campaign, but it's a great sadness that, that we're not in the lead on this. And I was extraordinarily happy to see Millbury College join in um, earlier this year. That was a good and useful deal. Now, the movement is just blossoming with millions of people coming from every direction. It's so beautiful to see. Bunches and bunches of the kids who fought the divestment thing in college graduate and wanted to do something else. They formed this thing called the Sunrise Movement. That's the movement behind the Green New Deal. They're the ones who recruited Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the congressman from the Bronx, and Ed Markey to, to push forward this legislation that's really visionary and powerful and going to make a difference. Some of you saw the people from Extinction Rebellion in London over the last few weeks kind of shutting down the streets and things. Well, it turned out that this was enormously effective. I mean, Two-thirds of Brits said that they were very much in favor of what was going on. And three or four days ago, the, uh, the British Parliament, a conservative Tory Parliament, passed the world's first climate emergency declaration, declaring that they were now in a climate emergency and needed to take strong action. Most beautifully of all for me has been watching school kids around the world stand up and do the right thing, uh, uh, beginning with Greta Thunberg in Sweden last September, but now there are millions and millions. And I have one of the pleasures of being out around the country is getting to meet so many of them. Um, and I was in Denver the other night with a 12-year-old who we had, I hadn't met her before, but we at a distance co-written an op-ed piece for the LA Times, kind of in the form of an excuse note to give your principal to explain why you were out of school for the day because you had to, you know, save the world and thing. Um, um, it's so much fun to see that. It's enormously important. And, and, now we need to do what they're asking, which is to back them up. We don't quite have a date yet, we will soon, but keep your eyes peeled. Come bottom, there's going to be all ages climate strikes beginning, okay? And we're going to need everybody to take a day away from everybody who can afford to lose a day's wages to be away from their job and out on the streets and things for a day. Uh, sometime in the fall and then maybe sometime again in the spring. Um, we need to do it because literally disrupting business as usual is now the goal. It's business as usual that's essentially doing this in. 
thing. It's the fact that we all get up and do more or less the same thing we did the day before, even in the midst of an enormous crisis. That's why we are where we are. It's also important that we do it because there's something mildly undignified about putting all the weight on fourth graders. Okay? So, so for no other reason than that, we're going to need people that can really well. Um, so, you know, the other lesson I've learned, and this is a, I don't know whether this is, a, I mean, this is, I probably shouldn't even say it, but I will, because, you know, I, in the end, I'm a writer, and honesty is what we do. Um, we don't know if we're going to win this fight. That's the thing. It's not like other fights that we've had. Um, we're used to fights, political fights, where the compromise is the sensible outcome, you know? I mean, if I think the minimum wage should be thirty dollars an hour and you're cool with slavery, you know, we should meet in the middle and call it fifteen dollars an hour and come back in a few years and try again, you know. That's how your change works, you know, for the most part. You, you want to kind of compromise and get someplace. But just as you really can't morally compromise with slavery, you can't physically compromise with climate change. The adversary here isn't other people. The adversary is physics, it's chemistry. And it won't compromise, and if we don't think, if we don't solve the problem soon, then we don't solve the problem. I've said before that, you know, my particular hero, Dr. King, used to end all his speeches by saying the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. This may take a while, but we're going to win. The arc of the physical universe is short, and it bends toward heat. If we don't win soon, then we don't win. And I, we don't know the outcome. We will know the outcome in the lifetimes of everyone in this room. I mean, at least we'll have a good idea of whether we made the kind of beginning important changes that we actually have to make over the next few years. That's the relevant time frame here, okay? Which is why it seems so urgent to me. Uh, it's, you know, sort of why I do what I do and why so many other people do what they do now every day to try and make that change come in time. Um, and I will just say, um, I think it's well worth the effort because the planet that we live on is so uncommonly beautiful. And, um, and the people on it, for the most part, so funny and interesting and kind. And it would be a great shame to see. The book ends in, well, sort of oddly in Cape Canaveral um, because I became, I was doing some writing about all the kind of richest people on the planet, because there's someone here about inequality, too, and the way that just as the temperature has risen, so this inequality on this earth. They're linked in profound ways, but, but one of the things that's very noticeable when you start looking at all the richest people on earth is, um, one thing they have in common is they all want to leave. They're all building rocket ships just as fast as they can, um, which, you know, might not be the worst outcome possible, but, but, um, but it's a reminder when we get down there, like, you know, what is fun to watch the rock? I watch one of Elon Musk's rocket stuff. It's fun. I mean, I was nine years old at the fall of 11. I'm a sucker for this kind of stuff. But what was even more beautiful the night before was to lie on a beach under a pretty much full moon and watch a sea turtle come out of the ocean and dig her pit and put her eggs in it and Trundle back into the ocean like people who sea turtles have done for 120 million years. And it just reminded me that, you know, the least hospitable square meter of planet Earth, someplace in the Sahara or up at the top of the Himalayas or something, is a thousand times more hospitable than any other place we're ever going to find out in the cosmos, you know. So, man, oh man, it just seems worth our lives to figure out how to preserve as much of this world as we can in this world we were born into. And I just really, really want to thank you all because I know that's precisely the work that many of you do every day. And it's 
just an honor to get to do it with you, and I look forward to just doing it shoulder to shoulder with you all going forward. So thank you very much. Absolutely 
everywhere you can as fast as you can. The same with wind turbines, probably other things that we've ways we've learned to generate electricity. The other technology, I'll just say in passing because I've talked more about it, is this technology of nonviolent movement building, which the suffragists and Gandhi and Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement and a million other people managed to uh, uh, sort of develop in the 20th century and now we're getting better and better at using it. Gives, that's the thing that gives hope for the small but many of us who stand up to the mighty and the few. And uh, I've got to tell you, I mean, the, the, when we started the Keystone thing, for instance, they pulled the National Journal, like a sort of trade paper in D.C., pulled its energy experts in D.C., and 93% of them said TransCanada would have its permit by the end of 2011. Uh, but then 1,200 people went to jail, and then hundreds of thousands of people organized. And, you know, Friday, TransCanada said, yet again, we're not going to get our construction underway on Keystone this year. I don't think they're ever going to get it. projected impacts to public health, which I think is an area that advocates sometimes have a difficult time making the link. So in your, in your many travels around the globe, what is the one thing you've learned about climate change and its impacts that you think people don't know? Well, I mean, talking about public health is really important. One of the things that turned me into an activist was being in Bangladesh. Uh, do some reporting, and they had their first big outbreak of dengue, which, as you know, is a mosquito-borne disease that's spreading like wildfire because the mosquito that carries it, the Yudis aegypti, truly likes the warm and wet world that we're building on its behalf. Um, I, I remember watching, I, mean, I, I was spending a lot of time in the slum, so eventually I got bit by the wrong mosquito. And I was as sick as I ever was, but I was strong and healthy going in, so I didn't die. But lots of people did die. And I remember sitting in the edge of this vast clinic with just people on cots, you know, shivering in this proper fever, and thinking, darn, this is so unfair. I mean, there's 180 million people in Bangladesh, but when you try to measure how much carbon they put out, it's like a rounding error of calculations, you know? They didn't do anything to cause this, this was us. So, yeah, those are really important things to bear in mind. I think the thing that people don't completely understand about climate change now is just the speed with which it happens. Our default in our minds is that geology takes an enormously long time. Um, and, you know, we all grew up going to grade school learning about the Pleistocene and the Pliocene and the, you know, these epics, geological epics that last 140 million years, and then, you know, we're alive at a completely anomalous time. We dug up 100 million years worth of biology, and we burned it in the course of a few decades, and now that's changing everything at a pace that hasn't happened since the last asteroid slammed into the planet in a big way 75 million years ago. So, that's what's happening now. Speed is the thing. Um, um, it's why it's why what David Zarkin was talking about was important. You know, it's like good if the legislature is nibbling around the edges of this. It's better than being Mike Pompeo and trying to make the whole thing worse and so on. But in truth, winning slowly on climate change is just another method of losing. Um, we have to do it. I found myself thinking about politics a lot as I was reading your book, and um, you know that, that climate change exceeds the boundaries and capabilities of politics, and yet it seems to be the tool that we often find ourselves using for these types of conversations. 
toward the, the end of your book, and I hope this isn't a spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't read it yet, hopefully you'll remedy that tonight. Um, you talk about next steps as including the need for a long, deep, engaged discussion about what we want. We don't want to let climate change and rampant technology development just happen to us. We, want, we need to decide if that's what we want or if we want something else. What is the role of politics in that? Um, I mean, I think on climate change, we've had enough discussion. I think we know where we are. I was, part of this book turns out to be about, and I haven't talked about it tonight, but about identifying a couple of threats that feel to me the way climate change felt to me 30 years ago. Something that, that weren't yet breaking over our heads, but that it was easy to see coming if you looked carefully at it. So there's a lot in there about artificial intelligence and its advanced forms and about human genetic engineering, um, which we're getting closer to all the time. We produced the first two designer babies in October. Okay. Um, but those are things about which we need to have a discussion. And the point I was trying to make in the book is. It would be a good idea, in this case, to have the discussion before things were out of control instead of afterwards. Because that's what we didn't do with climate change, thanks to the fossil fuel industry. And that's why we're in this fix, where every answer is a tough answer. Right. And so with this upcoming presidential election, um, what would you like people to keep in mind about um, where we're headed with these issues? So the first thing to keep in mind is the presidential election is 18 months away. So do not spend the next 18 months obsessing every moment about how your person is doing and so on and so forth. Some of it will sort itself out. We've got a lot of work to do anyway, okay? The election's gonna be important, but elections are not the only thing that need to happen. We need to stand up to corporate power in all kinds of ways, uh, so on and so forth. That said, it's very good to see that this is now not just a issue, but in some ways the issue, at least within the Democratic Party. Polling last week from CNN said that among Democratic primary voters, climate change was now by far the number one issue. Healthcare, education, absolutely everything else. That's appropriate, and that's an enormous change. We used to beg and plead that they would ask one question about climate change at the debates, and they never did. Um, 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 that's not going to be a problem this year. The emphasis now is on making sure that every one of those candidates is a climate change candidate, and that whoever wins the nomination I think they're going to use it as a real bludgeon against the incumbent because it's miles out of touch with where most Americans are on this issue. You find very few people who believe that climate change is a hoax, um, much less a hoax invented by the Chinese. And you find very few people who are going to join Mike Pompeo in cheering on the rapid melt of the Arctic or the disintegration of our other uh, systems. I think this is one of the places, I think it's going to be a huge political issue, which is good because we're running out of, we actually are out of presidential cycles. I mean, you remember the IPCC, the New Governmental Panel on Climate Change, said in their report last November that if we weren't making fundamental transformation by 2030, there's no way we can catch up with climate change. All of you know about our politics and everything. We're going to be making a fundamental change in 2030. We're going to have to be doing all the groundwork for that in 2020. I mean, that's how long it takes to get anything that even approaches fundamental happening in this field. So I mean, this is a crucial election, but, I, but, I, but, but we can't, that's not the only thing to work on. I'm doing my best to think as little as possible about it for the moment because we've got other tasks to do too. skepticism about the, uh, the potential for politics, but I can't help myself, so I'm going to have to ask another one. Um, what are the kinds of policies that you want to see politicians pursuing within the bounds of what you think politics can accomplish 
you can go, we have a, we have a 350 now has a uh, 501C4, you're the attorney. That's the, uh, that, that's the thing where you can do political things. And our main contribution so far uh, has been to set up this scorecard on climate stuff. And it's, you can find it easily. Uh, you just Google 350 climate scorecard. And there are three things that we think are important for presidential candidates. One, are they going to support the Green New Deal? Now, at the moment, it's a little hard to say exactly what that is because it isn't completely down on paper yet. But for the moment, it means a really broad, deep, thoroughgoing commitment to decarbonization on a profound scale. Second thing is, will you work, and this is something presidents can do with executive authority to keep carbon in the ground. That is, when you stop granting new permits to drill and mine on public lands, and will you do everything possible, which is a lot, to stop the construction of new fossil fuel infrastructure? Make sure that there aren't the federal permits that are necessary to build things like pipelines. And the third thing is the easiest one of all, will you stop taking money from the fossil fuel industry? And I can say that the activism on all this stuff is working, I think, Five of them at the moment have sort of have a trifecta across the board. Bernie, uh, obviously. Elizabeth Warren, who's doing just remarkable stuff for public lands policy, which is and really smart and interesting. Uh, Jay Inslee, governor of Washington. Um, Christian Children in New York. And I forget. Maybe better. I've definitely this week uh, announced he'd take no more money from the fossil fuel industry. And he said, they said, why did you say that? He said, well, I said it because so many activists kept asking me about it everywhere I went. So they're like, okay, that's exactly how it's supposed to work. Thank you very much. In your book, you talk about how after the revelation that Exxon knew about climate change and how long they knew about it, you talk about the useful naivete of protesters who reacted with rage and expected more, as opposed to um, many people, probably a little older, who said, what do you expect? That's, that's what you can get from a corporation. Um, and we see a lot of powerful action coming from you, as you mentioned earlier. What is so useful about naivete? Well, so that, you know, Exxon thing was really interesting. When the news came out that Exxon, these exposés explaining that Exxon had done all the science around climate in the 1980s and knew everything about it, that to me was the missing, you know, the one thing we didn't, hadn't understood until that point was the kind of depth of the deceit and chicanery that had been going on here. And what a moment it would have been. I mean, that was the man in the high castle kind of alternative history moment, you know? That, that's the, if, as I said before, the CEO of Exxon just said, yeah, you know what? Nielsen's right, the temperature's going up, we gotta do something. That would be the place where history would have turned in a very different way. So I didn't want those revelations to disappear, and I was got a little tired of people immediately tweeting out, oh, well, of course Exxon, that's a gift to them to say that. Um, um, the better and more appropriate reaction is to be outraged by it and to say that's what we did was despicable and wrong. We're going to hold you accountable for it in every way we can think of. I mean, for me, at the beginning, because I did not want the story to disappear, that meant I went and you know, handcuffed myself to the pump at the Exxon station in the middle of Burlington with a little sign that says this pump is closed because Exxon lied, and just on the theory that it would extend the story a couple of days. And I got a, right after I got out of the police station, I got a note from a friend of mine on Facebook who said, yeah, you're, that was the top trending thing for like half an hour until it was replaced by a video of a corgi barking at a miniature pumpkin. Um, <laughs> So I think that that kind of naivete 
even if you have to fake it a little bit, is the right reaction in a lot of these cases. And kids don't have to fake it. They're actually really, uh, you know, nonplussed at the fact that their elders are trying to take care of things, you know? Um, they've been two or three times, people of kids have marched to the state house this year saying, get with it, do something about this. And they're hopeful and all the state reps come in and say, oh, thank you for bringing us all this hope. <laughs> well, but right about by about next year, the kids are not going to be so hopeful and they're going to be a little more angry. And I mean, one of the good things about Greta uh, Thunberg is she's autistic, which she talks about a lot, and it allows her a kind of um, bluntness that I don't know if anybody saw the film of her at the, at the House of Commons in the UK, but it was great. She kept saying, um, can you hear me? Is this microphone working? Because I'm not sure you're hearing me. <laughs> is, my, is my English good enough? Because I'm not sure you're understanding what I'm saying here. <laughs> Very effective. More of that, please. I'm going to pivot a little bit, and um, I think we're all interested in getting to know you a little bit and what brings you to this work. What would you say is your job description? Uh, you know, I mean, at this point, um, I mean, I was, a, I mean, I thought of myself always as a writer, and I still do. That's why craft, the thing I know how to do, um, but at a certain point, as I said, when I figured out that we were in an argument and that another book was not going to sufficiently move the needle on this, I had to sort of try and teach myself how to do other things. Um, they don't come naturally to me. Writers are almost always introverts by nature. I mean, it's good to hear with you all, but I just assume be in Ripton Titan, you know? Um, 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 but that's all right. I mean, one way to say it is, uh, I learned to go outside my comfort zone because the planet is eight miles outside of its comfort zone, so that's what people need to learn how to do. We need different things for different people. It never occurred to me I was going to end up, you know, going to jail sometimes and things. Um, um, and I don't. No, I mean, it's not something to do lightly, and, and I don't enjoy it, but it's not the end of the world. At least if you're, you know, skin color of almost everyone in this room, you know, the end of the world is the end of the world, so that's why one needs to do these kind of things. Uh, other people do different things, but it's definitely time to do more than we're doing because um, it's abundantly clear that the things we're doing aren't yet adding up to an off. The temperature continues to rise. So, so, so I guess the best description, I mean, I'm sort of a volunteer couple, you know, <laughs> and there are days when that's, you know, I said before, I don't know if we're going to win or not, and I, and I really do. Um, and there are days like today when I read that UN report and when it just wakes up somewhat despairing. Um, um, and those are days when it just has to be enough that you're making life much harder for both of us. Uh, that has to suffice sometimes, just to you know get one through the next moment. But I do think that we're in a climate moment now. It feels different to me than it's felt at almost any point in the last 30 years. And so all I say is, let's do not waste this climate moment, because it may be the last moment like this that we get at a time when we're still able to make real use out of it. So, if you've been for some reason keeping your powder dry, waiting for the moment when it really matters, this is the moment when it really matters. Let's get on it. in a manner that's not different from how we did the day before in the middle of this crisis? Well, 
so this is the, we should have just stopped before we died. here. This, this is the now moment when I'm going to avoid you, just a tiny bit. Um, no. um, people keep talking, people keep talking about, and I don't have the answer to this, and I don't know everything about it or whatever else, but just as a small example, like, my guess would be that circa 2019 on this planet, building giant parking garages. <laughs> and, uh, which they built in like 1908, thinking they were going to breed the next generation of hackney cow purses, you know, only to have the automobile two years later replace it. I don't know what the answer is. All I'm saying is, when you think about small things to do, think about everything. Think about sort of transformations. I don't know the answer to this. I'm not a monitor. Uh, I love coming here. Um, um, and, and it'll suffice for me if you keep it McDonald's free, you know, that will, that will do. But um, in one's life, there are lots of things that everybody can figure out how to do. And I gather, I would bet that most of the people in this room have done most of those things. The most important thing individuals can do is just be less individuals. Join together with other people in the movements that are big enough to start affecting policy. So, this year, club around the world, 350.org around the world, the, the, that's why people started these things, so that they had some ability to, to, to be work. There's no way to stand up to the co brothers. Uh, you know, one DVD all at a time, one Tesla at a time, you know. My house is covered with solar panels. I'm really proud of it, but I don't try to fool myself at this point that that's how we stop climate change in the time that we have. Um, um, it's if we take, take what energy we have to figure out how to combine. And here's what I'll just say about that. When you do these things, when you work on an investment or a stock in pipelines or a striking when the time comes next year or whatever it is, just realize that you have an enormous number of brothers and sisters in every corner of the planet who are in a same fight and who are watching and loving what it is that, that you do. And you should take great strength from them and pleasure in watching them hold up their part of the spot. Especially in places where people have done nothing to cause the problem. This book is dedicated to one of my just favorite colleagues, a woman who died much too early last year, from the name Karate Timal. And she was the organizer of 350 in the South Pacific. Uh, she organized all those islands, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, the Marshalls, Micronesia, the Solomons, that probably are not going to exist by the end of the century. But they're not giving up. Their slogan is, we're not drowning, we're fighting. And the fighting they're doing is amazing. Some of you will remember when we did this big climate march in New York City, 400,000 people in the streets of New York. That same week, they had already organized the malls in each of those islands built an indigenous canoe, they felled a tree and built one of their kind of traditional canoes, they took them all to Newcastle in Australia, which is the biggest coal port in the world, and they used it for a day to blockade the biggest ore ships in the world. I wish I had a picture, because what I want to show you, what I want to say is, when you saw the picture, you saw the fight. You see these pictures of the four or five people in canoes just to put in these giant ships that can't move the car over. Um, um, this same summer in Seattle Harbor, thousands of our brothers and sisters used canoes and small craft to blockade the giant drilling rigs that Shell wanted to send into the Arctic. We call them kayakists. Um, 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 and in both cases, when you saw the picture, you sort of understood this is a fight between 
the small but the many against the big and the few. And that's one of the oldest, I'm a writer, that's one of the oldest kind of literary tropes that there is. It's the rebel alliance against the Death Star. Okay? And if you have any doubts about the Death Star, go read that Mike Pompeo speech from yesterday. Just look it up online. See someone, see the Secretary of State of the United States, arguably the second most powerful person in the country, applauding the idea that the Arctic is rapidly melting, talking on and on about other gold and diamonds that they're going to find up there. I mean, it's, it's clinical, and it's horrible, and we can beat it, but only if we come together in large numbers and we do it fast. The thing that I hold in my mind that makes me understand the possibility is that and there's people in this room who can remember in 1970 at the first Earth Day, before Earth Day is what it is now, so a nice you know, part of kind of fun. First Earth Day, 20 million Americans in the street, 10% of the gang population, okay? And they weren't all merry about it. Some of them were pretty pissed off, you know? That 10% of the population turned out to be enough for the next four years, Richard Nixon, who had not an environmental bone in his pocket, <laughs> signed every piece of legislation on which we still depend, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, everything that Trump's trying to gut. 10%, that's enough. We can do something on that scale. The job of activists, the job of activists is not in the end to win particular pieces of legislation, it's to change the zeitgeist, it's to change what people perceive as normal and natural and obvious. And if we can do that, then we can do it quickly, then we have a shot. Not a shot at stopping global warming, too late for that, okay? But a shot at stopping it short of the place where it makes civilizations like the ones we've known impossible. That's what we're playing for. So that's a long answer to a short and good question. Oh, guys, thank you all.